hero is John Wesley Powell, born in 1834 in this town, Mount Morris, New York. As a kid, Powell was somewhat of a nerd about science, especially geology. Geology is the study of natural substances that make up the earth. Powell loved all different kinds of rocks, limestone, marble, granite, and he loved finding ancient fossils buried inside rock layers. While he still had two arms, Powell rode down the Ohio and Mississippi rivers during his mid-twenties. But his quest to explore America was interrupted by the bloodiest conflict his country had ever seen, the Civil War. Powell hated slavery and saw the war as a chance to fight for its abolition in the South. In 1862, he found himself the leader of an artillery unit in the ferocious Battle of Shiloh. During the battle, Powell raised his right arm to give his men the signal to fire, and all of a sudden a bullet blasted into his forearm, leaving him with half an arm. In order to stop a deadly infection from spreading, doctors had to cut off the rest of Powell's limb. Powell survived the war, achieving the rank of Major, and you might think that at this point he had had enough excitement in his life. But his passion for geology was strong, and with only one arm, in 1867, he set off to the Colorado Territory on an expedition to climb in the Rocky Mountains. On this expedition, he was joined by a rough-and-tumble ex-soldier and first-rate mountain guide named Jack Sumner, who became a close companion of Powell's. Sure, they made it to the top of Pikes Peak, America's most iconic mountain since its discovery in 1806, but Powell had grand goals, even more so than climbing the 14,000-foot tall Pikes Peak with one arm. He had his sights set on a much more colossal destination. On May 24, 1869, Major Powell and his nine men set their four wooden boats into the waters of the Green River and they launched from right about this spot here. Now if you're wondering why Major Powell and his men picked a small mining town in the middle of the desert as their place to launch, it was because the newly built Transcontinental Railroad came right to the town and Major Powell was able to bring his boats and supplies by the Union Pacific Railroad. Hey, my hey, right. big boy. Man. Yeah, he's, well, he'll be, he'll be born in, uh, he's a big boy. He's a real yeah. big boy. Yeah, he's lost a lot of weight, though. Really? He was up to 140 pounds, but he's down to about 116 now. He's beautiful. So it wasn't long after leaving Green River when Major Powell and his expedition reached this stretch of river called Flaming Gorge. Unfortunately, we can't go onto the river right now because it's covered in ice, as you can see. Those little specks out there on the river, tents of ice fishermen. This was a relatively calm stretch of river. Major Powell's expedition didn't reach their first rapid until about a week after leaving Green River. It's amazing to consider that Powell's men actually rowed their boats facing backwards because it was easier on their bodies to row than facing forward. Powell himself, of course, only had one arm, so he couldn't row. He would stay at the front of the boat, leading the other four, and give them directions to let them know what was coming ahead of them in the river. 
If a rapid looked impossible to sail through, Powell would order the expedition to portage or take the heavy 21-foot-long wooden boats out of the water and carry them on the shoreline past the rapid. But if there was no shoreline, the men would have to do what they called lining, attach the boats together with a rope, and while standing on a rock, hold the ropes in their hands and guide the boats as best they could through the dangerous stretch of water. Powell did not know the exact distance they would have to travel to finish their journey. His goal was to end up in the Gulf of California in Mexico. They had thousands of miles in front of them, but at least they still had a year's worth of food and supplies, right? Not long after Flaming Gorge, the Green River took them through the Utah Territory, then a short time into the Colorado Territory, and then back to Utah. On June 8th, Powell pulled his boat off to the side of the river and gazed at a rushing, rock-filled area of the river in front of them. Figuring that the boats behind him would land, he began to plan a way through this rapid. Then, all of a sudden, he heard shouting from the river beneath him, and he knew that some of his companions were in grave danger. Three of his companions in a boat called the No Name had been sucked into the rapid and were being carried away into a rushing, roaring section of water. Realizing his error, Powell went as fast as he could back to where the other boats behind him were and told them, don't go any further. Then he turned around and raced back to the point where the No Name had disappeared into the water. He searched hard to see his men and saw them below, rowing through the rapid, but with no control over their boat. And then, all of a sudden, the boat smashed into a rock, split in two, and the men plunged into the water. Somehow they were able to scramble onto a sandbar in the middle of the river. One of Powell's companions, Jack Sumner, bravely took a boat and went out to them and through great rowing skills, somehow managed to pick them up from the sandbar and bring them back to safety on shore. The men were cold, soaked, and badly shaken after the disaster. In fact, that's what they named that stretch of water, Disaster Falls. They were all alive, yes, but they were not on the three boats and they had lost a third of their supplies in the no-name when it sunk into the river, including much of their food, some of the scientific instruments Powell was using, guns, bullets, and some of their valuable maps. Remember that fact about the maps. It might become important later on. As they passed further south into Utah, they had a constant fear hanging over their heads. What was coming in front of them? They had no clear idea because they were the first expedition to go down the Colorado River into the Grand Canyon. What they knew was that Green River, Wyoming, where they started, was at about 6,000 feet above sea level. And where they wanted to end up in the Gulf of California was just under 1,000 feet above sea level. That meant that somewhere along the line, the river decreased by 5,000 feet in elevation. What they didn't know was if this was a gradual change, or if there was a waterfall the size of Niagara Falls or bigger waiting in front of them. All they could do was continue on. Over the next three weeks, Powell and the eight men still with him continued on rowing and portaging and lining. They reached a significant milestone on July 23rd, the confluence of the Green and Colorado Rivers. Powell knew that the Colorado River led into the Grand Canyon and that their destination was close. Their food was running out slowly but surely. It was with relief and amazement that on August 5th, Powell and his men saw canyon walls rising higher and higher in front of them. They had at last made it to the Grand Canyon, or as Powell called it in his journal, the Great Unknown. And that is where we are going. Here is the butter. I know it's sour here. and good. Just hanging out here with some iced tea. Good. Good to see you. You too. This is my friend Bill Potter, everybody. He owns about 10,000 books and he's basically read every single one of them. And he lost his voice the last couple days because he's done so much talking about history at conferences. Is that right, Mr. Potter? Yeah, that's right. Not much left. I'm doing my best. Or 
Right now we're driving through the Hualapa Indian Reservation en route to the Grand Canyon. This canyon was the last great unexplored region of America. Spanish explorers had discovered it during the mid-1500s and had stood at the top of the rim, overlooking it but not going down into it. And 277 miles long and over 6,000 feet deep at its deepest point, this was the biggest canyon in the country. Here, Powell was in his element. There were rock walls of up to a mile high of all different shapes and substances, like limestone and sandstone. Two weeks passed. By mid-August, all Powell and his men could see in front of them was more river, more rapids, and more canyon. The men were growing restless. Their supplies were close to running out. All they had left was spoiled bacon and some coffee for their daily rations. Based on the information that Powell gathered from the top of the canyon, he estimated that the Virgin River was about 45 miles away in a straight line. That doesn't count all the twists and turns that the river would make between where he was and where it was. Things were heating up between the crew. As a military man, Powell was used to order and obedience and had little time for people making mistakes that cost him a great deal. And it was just around this time that one of his men, Bill Dunn, an experienced mountain man, broke one of Powell's most important scientific instruments, a barometer. Powell demanded he pay him back for it, and at first Bill Dunn thought he was joking. Then he quickly realized that Major Powell was not kidding, and a bitter quarrel started between the men. Then on August 15th, Oromel Howland, a veteran of the Battle of Gettysburg, dropped a map, a very valuable map, in a rapids while he was rowing through. Things turned heated when Powell chewed him out for this mistake and also for what happened at Disaster Falls back in June. For it was Ormo Howland who had been in charge of the no-name boat that had sunk in the rapids. See, I told you the map fact would be important later on. Tensions were extremely high in the camp with the men cursing at each other and making death threats. No violence was carried out, but the men never had the same level of camaraderie again. Okay, check. I'll just check it. Another two weeks passed, and the expedition was now down to just a few days' supply of coffee. On August 27th, they came up to a huge rapid, the worst they had seen yet, and Armel Howland, his younger brother Seneca, and Bill Dunn decided they had had enough and that it was too risky to go on. Powell and the other five men, though, were determined to finish the expedition or die trying. And so the expedition separated at this point, which is why it's known today as Separation Canyon. The Howland brothers and Bill Dunn somehow managed to climb up one of the walls of this canyon, hoping to reach a Mormon settlement about 75 miles away. They were never seen or heard from again. 
Powell and his men now had no choice but to charge into the huge rapid in front of them. After ducking in and out of waves and managing to stay away from any deadly whirlpools, they made it through to the other side and found more canyon in front of them. But the very next day, against all hope and expectations, on August 29, 1869, Powell and his expedition emerged from the canyon walls and found themselves surrounded by rolling desert lands. They had at last made it out of the Grand Canyon. Soon after, they made contact with a group of Mormon settlers who helped them return to civilization. And that, my friends, is the bite-sized story of how a one-armed scientist with a big dream led the first expedition down the Grand Canyon. Let's hear it for the great mister who's he's kind of shy to come on the camera. Mr. Bill Potter, <laughs> historian and adventure extraordinary. He's been down the Grand Canyon more times than John Wesley Powell ever was. But let's also hear it for John Wesley Powell and his ragtag group of Civil War veterans and mountain men. And until next time, go learn your history.